Thanks, JP. Uh, this is the second time I've been here, and this is great community building, and it's good to see all the young people interested in new materials. Um, so I am feeling kind of like an old dog these days. Uh, I hurt my knee about two weeks ago playing basketball, so if you see me limping around, it's... Uh, so, and the sad thing is, is I was playing against some, half the people I'm playing against were 70 years old or over. <laughs> so I'm the one who ends up getting hurt. So, uh, so today I'll talk about um, a lot of fun things going on with ex exfoliable materials. And so my group uh, is, so we have a group uh, at the University of Tennessee, and they recently built us a new building, which is right on the river. Uh, and so our building is sort of in the background there, but we're, we have a beautiful place to work now where we can look out our, our office window and see this beautiful uh, river and there's a nice running trail along there. So we're doing pretty well in terms of uh, location. And uh, so uh, Asith is here today. He's one of the members in the group. You can see him here. Uh, and I've highlighted Amanda because she's the one who made all the pictures you'll see later of, the, of, the, uh, of some of the tra vapor transport growth. All right, so I, one, one thing I like to say is that we work on digital synthesis of quantum materials, and it's just a joke because we use our digits to, to grow the material. <laughs> and, uh, and here's my favorite cartoon. Uh, Og discovered fire and Thorak invented the wheel. There's nothing left for us. And so you'll see a lot of that actually in, in science is that because, you know, science has progressed a lot, and there's especially uh, among... Uh, Theorists, you know, there's almost a feeling that there's not much left out there to, to do. And uh, that's especially true in high energy physics. And uh, so actually there's one philosophy here that, that Freeman Dyson uh, elucidated is that uh, there's different types of scientists and he calls them unifiers and diversifiers. And the unifiers are, they try to uh, explain the universe with a single equation, basically. Whereas diversifiers, and, and we would fall under that category, and we want to find uh, uh, new things and you know heterogeneous things, and we want we want to make the universe a little more complicated and more more interesting. <laughs> and so, one of the nice things about making new materials is that you can be a diversifier. You can find new things to keep the theorists awake at night, uh, which is what we love to do. <laughs> so, uh, what is a new material? So a new material in physics is different than chemistry. And so the chemi I'd say the chemistry definition is sort of a new combination of, no of elements with unique structure. But in physics, or materials physics, uh, you can even find even something like uh, magnesium diboride is a new material because it was uh, a new property had recently been discovered uh, back you know, 15 years ago when superconductivity, even though people knew about magnesium diboride for, you know, hundreds of years, maybe a hundred years or something. Nobody knew it was superconducting. So, uh, or you can dope a, a known material and find a new uh, behavior, sort of like what happened with the manganites. Um, you know, people knew about manganites for a long time, but didn't know about the, you know, colossal magnetoresistance. Or, you know, graphene. Uh, it's a new a nanomaterial, right? Graphite had been around forever. It's hardly a new material, but graphene was a new material. And even the surface of a crystal can be viewed as a new material, and you can find interesting behaviors at the surface. So new materials are uh, kind of a broad category. All right, why would anybody want to make new materials for a living? Right, it's, uh, well, one reason, uh, it really aligns us. See, one of the advantages that theorists have is where they're not so tied to a particular technique. Um, and we're, we're kind of like that as new materials people. We can be problem driven rather than technique driven. And uh, you know, there's this old saying, if you, if you have a hammer, every problem begins to resemble a nail, which is why I don't want to see a surgeon for my knee right away. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid if I go to a surgeon, he's gonna say, yeah, you need surgery. <laughs> so I'll give it a couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> so, okay. Uh, there's lots of opportunities to be creative. Uh, this makes it a lot of fun, actually. You can go into the lab on Monday and uh, you know, have an idea. On Wednesday, you can figure out that your idea didn't work. Try a new idea. Uh, nearly instant gratification. It really is. I mean, a lot of growth you can do very quickly and, and measure properly. You can grow something, measure it in a squid. Didn't work. Try something else. 
Uh, it's a lot of fun. So that's, uh, I mean, uh, most of us are going into science because it's fun, so making materials is fun. All right, so one, one thing, uh, uh, this is a great article if you ever get a chance to read it. And this guy, Nassim Taleb, he's an economist. He wrote a book called The Black Swan. He, he really studies, uh, he worked with uh, Mandelbrot. He's kind of an interesting guy. And he studies how, uh, how human mind uh, perceives risk and perceives uh, probability and things like that. And, uh, but basically, it turned out that the drug uh, revolution sort of uh, dwindling, there was, a, there was a dwindling pipeline of drug discovery, uh, mainly because the, uh, the researchers were not allowed to follow up on discoveries they made that were, that were serendipitous but weren't aligned with what they were supposed to be doing. So they were kind of cut off from following promising, or potentially promising things. And so we want to avoid that, of course. And there, there is, and you know, we just push back a little bit. Uh, this is from this uh, synthesis science. So this is, uh, this was in 2016. There was a workshop not too far away from here. It was in Rockville. Uh, and basically, one of the conclusions was that we don't want to give up on exploratory synthesis. Uh, and, uh, and there's, you know, there's this big push on materials by design, and now it's machine learning. The machines are even going to do the designing, uh, not just. So, and that's fine. We want all the help we can get, but we don't want to completely uh, outsource our, our business to the machines. That's all. And uh, so that's, that's something I think uh, we all agree on. All right, so here's some advice for sort of people who are just starting in this field. And uh, six months in the lab can save you an hour in the library. Uh, <laughs> that's good advice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is good advice. Uh, there's no reason not to know what's been done uh, before. Before you know, if you're going to start doing something, you might as well spend. And, and this is and this should be even maybe 30 minutes on Google nowadays. Um, you know, you should definitely do your research before you, you. There's no point in spending a lot of time and then figure out that somebody's already done it and it didn't work. Don't believe everything you read. There's a lot of mistakes in the literature. Just because it got published doesn't mean it's automatically right. It might be right, it might not be right. Uh, there's a lot of mistakes in phase diagrams. There's mistakes everywhere. So just, car just carry that around with you. Uh, I've noticed, especially beginning students, they just, if it's in print, and it looks nice, they just automatically believe it. Don't, autom don't automatically believe everything just because it's in print. All right, this is a biggie. If you have a good idea, there's, it's almost, uh, certain that somebody else has that same idea. Uh, you're not, if you don't think you're the only one with a good idea. There's a lot of smart people out there and there's a lot of people that have good ideas. <laughs> and, uh, and so that follows on to number four. If you have a good idea and you don't do anything with it, then it means nothing. Uh, it's almost as if you didn't have the good idea. Science doesn't reward good ideas unless you do something. And doing something means publishing. Okay, five. Seek out low-hanging fruit. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of problems out there that you can spend a lot of time on and you get very little uh, benefit from it. So I would say spend, the, spend your time and effort on things where you can get a lot of benefit without, without working as hard uh, as, you, as you might have to on some of those other problems. So pick the problems where you can make a lot of progress uh, fairly quickly. Is and that and that that that's a sort of not everybody needs to follow that advice, but a, but a lot of people should, I think. Okay, what is an exfoliable material? And the definition of exfoliate is to come off in thin layers or scales. And here's where we're going to play this little video to show how easy it was to make graphene. Uh, and and people who haven't seen this, it's really it's pretty amazing. Next, hold the 
the scotch tape at the edge of the graphite plate. Peel it off gently and do this step several times until you obtain a nearly transparent region on the scotch tape. After this, take a clean silicon wafer to transfer the scotch tape graphene onto the wafer. Use plastic tweezers and gently rub the area of the scotch tape where graphene may potentially be. Slowly peel off the scotch tape so as not to break any potential graphene sheets. Use an optical microscope to view and find graphene. Graphene appears as a purple spot on the screen. At the center of the screen is multi-layer graphene and at the right corner, lower right corner of the screen is single layer graphene. There you go. That was worth a Nobel Prize. Um, it, it's really pretty easy, right? But somebody had to have that clever idea. Okay. Fun with exfoliable materials. So what can you do with uh, materials you can exfoliate? So the first thing you can do is the single layer materials. So graphene is a single layer. But there are other single layer materials. And what sort of broke open the floodgates was this particular, was this paper right here, where they made a single layer moly disulfide. So moly, it's, it, they call it a single layer. It's actually three layers of atoms, but it's a single layer of the chemical unit. And so the, the big thing here was that uh, when you make this material uh, atomically thin, that the optical properties change dramatically. The band structure changes from an indirect gap to a direct gap, and the photoluminescence properties uh, become much better. And uh, so that sort of kicked off this revolution, this beyond graphene revolution that's still going on. Um, and then people uh, were able to make devices uh, like FETs. Uh, so, and some of these were very high quality. And remember, uh, graphene is a semi-metal, so it's really not ideal for electronics. You really want semiconductors for FETs. Um, and so these filled the bill. And there's lots of these uh, transition metal dichalcogenides. There's a nice book here that I recommend. Uh, here's your uh, calcogens here. Uh, all of these elements that are shaded, and these are color-coded because not all of them form with all three calcogenides, but these are basically, there's, there's lots and lots of materials to think about. Um, they form some layered uh, crystal structures with a couple of different coordinations. Uh, they have different terminology. This is trigonal, this is hexagonal, and this is uh, rhombohedral, and this is one layer two layers, three layers, so they have a little code there. And then people have started thinking about um, other materials, and there's a whole, there's lots of papers like this where people have considered all kinds of layered materials, and, and, uh, and this is actually a pretty good use of the sort of high throughput computing, because what they can do is they can calculate things like cleavage energies. And so they can calculate whether things are likely to cleave and, and be stable. They, they can calculate the Young's modulus for a single layer, for example, and whether it's going to be self-supporting. And so this is actually quite nice. There's several papers along these lines, but this is one of the earlier ones. Uh, but you can see there's dozens and dozens of materials that are potentially cleavable down to single layers. Some of them are semiconductors. These are their gaps. Some are metals. Uh, some are antiferromagnets, some are ferromagnets. And so uh, really that really got the ball rolling the last couple of years. And so um, for those of us who work on quantum materials, so these sort of these single layer materials or few layer materials are kind of a, a bridge between bulk materials and nanomaterials. Uh, so we can, we can work on the bulk materials. A lot of them have very interesting properties, and then our, our collaborators who are doing nanoscience 
can do measurements on them as well. And so you can have a huge impact with your materials. Uh, and, and these few layer materials have some interesting new degrees of freedom, like the layer thickness, the you know, layer number, the properties change if you have one layer, two layer, three layers. Uh, they're incredibly tunable. You can tune them with electric fields or strain. Uh, so they're, they're really interesting from, from a scientific point of view. So one example for, is, is mag magnetic materials, uh, which are sort of uh, currently in vogue. Uh, you can imagine making single layer magnets. You can have maybe a calcogenide and a, or a halide layer, a magnetic layer, another calcogenide layer. And so one of the samples that we were working on for this purpose is chromium silicon tellurium-3. You can see here you've got a layer of tellurium. You've got these uh, silicon dumbbells, these purple chromiums. And these, uh, these have been predicted to be magnetic in single layers. Uh, unfortunately, the people uh, we were working with didn't discover the magnetism in single layers. But this material, chromium germanium tellurium-3, uh, was discovered to be a uh, single layer magnet. Uh, it turns out that these were, the, the trick to, to, uh, to getting all this to work was to be able to do everything without exposing the sample to air. And not too many people were able to do that. And an even better one uh, turned out to be this chromium iodine 3, right? And so here's, a, here's you can see, this is a Moke experiment on a single layer. Uh, you can see this nice hysteresis loop. It turns out that when you, and when you have two layers, uh, it looks like the, uh, you have to go, it really looks like two layers are antiferromagnetic. Uh, and then if you apply enough field, you can polarize them. Uh, and then three layers, you're back to a ferromagnet again. So this is kind of unusual. Sort of one layer, you're a ferromagnet. Two layers, you're an antiferromagnet. So this is pretty cool stuff. Here's an antiferromagnet. Uh, iron phosphorus trisulfide. This is work coming out of South Korea. Here's a spin liquid uh, that we've been working on, or approximate spin liquid. So this is ruthenium trichloride. So this has a honeycomb lattice. Uh, so we're studying the bulk properties uh, with neutron scattering. But uh, this, this is really a pretty good approximation to a Kateyev uh, magnet. And uh, so one of our collaborators, uh, Eric Hendrickson at, at Washington University, has been cleaving these and doing some Raman experiments. And so these are actually fairly stable in air, as it turns out, uh, when you cleave down to single layers. Other groups have been studying superconductors and the single layer limit. Um, so this is uh, Abe Patsipathy's group at Columbia. And so they, these are pretty interesting. And so what they, what the main breakthrough here uh, was that they've discovered a way to protect the samples. So what they do, this is very important actually. So the material is niobium diselenide. Uh, in bulk it superconducts at, I don't know, 7K or something. Um, but the thing is if you cleave it down to a single layer, it will die in air. Okay, so you have to learn to protect it if you're going to do any measurements on it. And so what they learned how to do at Columbia is to put a piece of boron nitride on top of it and make contacts. Um, and so they were able to make contacts and then they could do all their measurements. And so that was the key to protect the sample, protect the single layer. So, um, so metals and narrow gap semiconductors tend to grow these amorphous oxide layers. And you can see it here. This is again from Abe's work, in this case on tantalum disulfide. So you get this amorphous oxide layer that just grows on top. And so it, it, uh, you really have to protect your samples from the atmosphere. OK, next thing you can do. So single layers was the first one. Uh, the next thing you can do with uh, layered materials or exfoliable materials is intercalate them. Okay, so intercalation basically means you're sticking things in between the layers, okay? In this case, uh, the, the, um, you're putting potassium, which are the purple balls, in between the carbons, which I guess are the black ones. Um, and you're making KC8 here. It superconducts with a TC of 0 .14, 0 0.14 degrees Kelvin. And so, uh, 
knowing this, this is why Art Hebbard immediately tried to dope C60 with potassium, right? Because he knew that potassium doping uh, graphite made it superconducting. And so that's what I mean about the low-hanging fruit, right? So if you, if you have this materials knowledge and something new comes along, you can immediately think of what to do next. And then maybe you can get a paper with 3,000 citations. Um, but that's, that's exactly what I mean about the low-hanging fruit. But okay, so that's intercalation. Here's another example. Uh, so this is zirconium uh, nitrogen chloride. And you, if you put a little lithium in, uh, in the van, the lithium goes in the van der Waals gap here, uh, you can make a superconductor. Okay, and we'll come back to this one in a little while, and you'll see why in a minute. Here's another one, uh, sodium cobalt oxide. Turned out when people uh, made it a, uh, Takeshi Yagami calls it a watery superconductor. You put water in, uh, you intercalate water, it becomes a superconductor. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, Okay, another thing you can do with uh, materials is ionic liquid gating. What is ionic liquid gating? Essentially what you want to do is you take your, and this says semiconductor here, but this is your sample. You put an ionic liquid on top of it, right? This blue, this, this electrolyte is an ionic liquid. The ionic liquid has basically positive and negative ions, okay? And so the idea is that you want to you apply a gate voltage, and so you, you end up with this layer, say, of positive ions that's uh, in contact with this top surface of your sample. So these positive ions are going to attract electrons, and you end up forming, say, a metallic uh, electron gas that, that you can sense with a source and a drain. Okay, so this is the cartoon. This is the cartoon picture of ionic liquid gating. So I can tell you as a fact that this cartoon is not very accurate. But this is a cartoon everybody carries around in the back of their head. There's actually a lot of chemistry going on uh, at, this, at this interface. You can, you can actually etch the materials. There's all kinds of stuff happening. You can intercalate. You can put hydrogen into your materials. There's all kinds. So, but this is a cartoon. And I think occasionally the cartoon is accurate. But most of the time, as far as I can tell, it's not very accurate. But, but that, we've learned that in the last few years. Not just us, but the community has learned that the cartoon is not, uh, but, but still, the cartoon. Okay, so uh, remember the zirconium nitrogen chloride, chloride? So it turns out if you, if you put an ionic liquid on top of it and you gate it, you can turn this into a superconductor. So that was very cool, right? So you can start with no gate voltage. It's an insulator or... I don't know why that's doing that, but it is. And as you gate it, you can turn it into a superconductor. So this really, this really put on a liquid gating on the map, okay? And so this was, so a lot of you guys don't remember uh, Jan Hendrik Schoen, right? Some of you do, but a lot of you don't. So this was the biggest fraud in physics, I think. Um, Jan Hendrik Schoen was a guy who wanted to do exactly this, okay? He, but he tried to do it. Uh, with, with uh, just an oxide, instead of an ionic liquid gate, you put an oxide layer and you try to gate, gate it through the oxide. And it turned out you just couldn't get enough of a, a carrier density. So using an oxide layer, you can only get about 10 to the 13 carriers per square centimeter. With an ionic liquid gate, you can go up to about 10 to the 15. And it turns out that those two orders of magnitude make a huge difference. But uh, Schoen published all this stuff, uh, and he had like, I don't know, just one Science and Nature article after another, and it all turned out to be wrong. And, uh, and some of it was even just fabricated. And so it was a big scandal. And, and then that left a bad taste in everybody's mouth for a long time, uh, until 2010, I think, is when this came out. And so this kind of reinvigorated that whole idea of gating. So here's another uh, nice piece of work. So here's a, a, a piece of uh, tantalum disulfide. And this has a very complex phase diagram uh, that you can tune uh, with a gate voltage, right? And this, so there's, this is like a uh, incommensurate charge density wave, a superconductor, 
a commensurate charge density wave, a nearly commensurate charge density wave. But it's a very rich phase diagram that's tunable with, a, with ionic, li ionic liquid gating. So that's pretty cool. Okay, stacking. So once you have all your, uh, your library of materials, right, what you can do is, is put them on various uh, objects. So here's an example where you put a piece of graphene on top of yttrium iron garnet and then you measure an anomalous Hall effect in the graphene and you can show uh, that you've actually turned by a proximity effect you've turned the graphene uh, ferromagnetic. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. And so the idea then is that you can stack individual layers on top of one another. So this was, this was the original idea but nowadays, these are going to be different quantum materials, right? You might put a magnet on top of a topological insulator next to a superconductor, and you can, you can stack anything you want. Uh, you could put a, you know, a spin liquid, and so the sky's the limit, right? You can just build these up just like Lego blocks and make your, make your new quantum material from these, build, from these uh, uh, single layer materials. Now, it sounds science fiction-y, but it actually works at least a little bit. Uh, there's uh, this thing called the Central Stacking Facility that Jim Hone built at Columbia. Turns out this is actually was built with a uh, MRSEC grant, so it's open to users. So if you guys ever want to use this, uh, it's available for users to go and use. So it's open to the community. And uh, so the idea is you can do everything in a controlled environment. You can, you can cleave your samples, you can stack them. You can, you know, do your Raman spectroscopy to make sure that things are under control. And uh, so a lot of progress is being made, really, on these, on these things. And so uh, one of the things uh, that you can do, so when you stack materials, you get this extra degree of freedom, right? You've got this, you know, do they stack? You know, how, how do the lattices align, right? And so that's another degree of freedom that you have. So people are studying uh, how, the electronic, how, how the electronic structure changes with that angle uh, of, the, of the two lattices. And so right now, the people are mostly studying just bilayers. I mean, that's enough to keep people busy. But, um, and so there's developments in what are called nano ARPES as well. And so, uh, so this was done, this is actually micro ARPES in this experiment. There's a, there's a a beam line at the advanced light source in Berkeley uh, and there's a guy named Eli Rothenberg there who's developing the ability to do ARPES on samples as small as like five microns and so you can study so a lot of these materials are becoming uh, able, you can study them now where the tools are becoming available to study them all right so now I'm getting to the meat of the <laughs> of the talk that was like a long introduction uh, so how do you grow exfoliable materials? And I'm, the main tool is vapor transport, okay? And I want to thank uh, Amanda. Um, where's Amanda? There's Amanda. So she, she made most of these slides for me. So the basic idea in vapor transport is you seal your starting materials in a silica tube and you apply a temperature gradient and the materials will grow at one end or the other depending on whether uh, the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Okay, so you start with your sealed tube. You have some reactants. You have a transport agent, which is typically a halogen. Uh, you have a temperature gradient. And so basically the reaction looks something like this. You start off with uh, material A, which is what you want to grow the, your sample of, uh, which is a solid. It, it reacts with a gas, which is typically your halogen. It forms some, in this case, a binary. On the, this is happening on the hot end of the tube. And then on the cold end of the tube, it basically, this, this reaction is going the other way. And it's depositing out your sample and releasing the gas. Um, and so this, the basic, so this is, a, this is an, a reaction that's in equilibrium. And you're using uh, Le Chatelier's principle to control which side your, your, your crystals grow. And so 
Uh, if the formation of AB is endothermic, the crystals will grow at the cold end. And if the a formation of AB is exothermic, the crystals will grow at the hot end of the tube. So typical transport agents are iodine, bromine, chlorine, HCl, uh, ammonium chloride, hydrogen, water, tellurium tetrachloride. In this case, this is just a source of chlorine, and et cetera. Typically, you want to add enough transport agent to have about one bar of pressure in the tube at the temperature that you're growing at. Okay. So a lot of, th this is not a new technique. There's a lot of uh, information out there. And so here's some of the, sort of the guild hall knowledge. Um, you know, you don't want to try to grow too fast. Uh, the te crystallization temperature has to be evaluated empirically. I mean, you can get close, I and mean, there's various chemical databases, these, these software programs to get you started. Um, you want a large crystallization chamber. You want you, uh, homogeneous temperature in the crystallization chamber. You want to use bigger diameter tubes often. And uh, you can use a smaller temperature difference if you use larger diameter tubes. And so, again, there's a lot of, lot of information out there. So that's some of the stuff Amanda's grown. So she's been working on these single layer magnets, a lot of these materials. Okay, so this is uh, the Amanda approach to growing. So essentially you want to uh, try to do a lot in the glove box. Uh, try to grind your starting materials and uh, you know, then seal it in a silica tube. Uh, you know, if you have volatiles, you can try to keep the top end of the, or the bottom end of the tube cold with a wet paper towel or, or even you know, liquid nitrogen or something, ice water, while you're sealing it so you don't uh, volatilize anything. Um, okay, you, you want to start with your polycrystalline material. Okay, after your sample, you want to grind it up and you can make sure you have a good sample to start with, good, good stoichiometry, um, seal it in your tube. One trick is you want to make sure it gets to the bottom of the tube, right, without getting a lot of stuff on the side of the tube. Uh, these, little, these little tricks, right, everybody's had to seal the tube with junk on the side, that's no fun. So you can use one of those, you have a long uh, a funnel with a long stem or just a long piece of paper or something to make sure it gets down to the bottom. You can keep the bottom of the tube cold so you don't volatilize your iodine or whatever you're using. Um, so, okay. Um, so there's a lot of trial and error. Uh, essentially, one key thing is that we don't have a lot of two-zone two furnaces. We have a lot of these little cheap mini mites. They're like $1,500 furnaces. We've probably got about 20 of them. Um, and it's, what you have to do is use the t natural gradient in the furnace, but you need to calibrate it a little bit with the, with the thermocouple. Uh, you, can, you can sort of set up the furnace like you're going to grow something, and, and then you can just go in with your thermocouple and map out the gradient. That way you'll know. You need to do this periodically because furnaces change with time. Um, but that'll get you in the ballpark in terms of your temperature gradients. Um, generally good to sit, put this uh, tube up on some stands here. That usually helps. You put it in the, you can get your, use the natural gradient of the furnace. Um, program your furnace to warm up slowly. Remember, it's easy to explode the tubes when you have volatiles in there, uh, so you have to go slow. And if you've done everything right, uh, you end up having beautiful crystals growing in your tube. Uh, so there's different steps you can, if, you, if it's not working, there's different things you can try. Uh, this is just, again, a lot of empiric, empirical uh, things to try. Um, you know, you can use more transport agent, less transport agent. You can change your temperature. Um, you can try to, if, you've, if you're getting too many nucleation sites, you, you can, you know, clean your tube with nitric acid. Um, sometimes if you, if you reverse 
you know, change the gradient for, and then start and start at the uh, over again going the other way. That helps. So there's different things to try if it's not working as well as you like it to work. And so here's some of the materials we've grown uh, with vapor transport in the lab. And uh, some of these are sort of self, like this one, the ruthenium trichlorate. It's more of a sublimation than a vapor transport. But. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. the different types of materials you grow with vapor, what's the sort of range of uh, time you let the two run? Yeah, it's typically a week or two for, for a lot of things. But, you know, I've read in the literature um, some of these uh, spinels will take two months, three months. Uh -huh. Yeah, there was, uh, you know, there, there was like a man, uh, was it? The scandium manganese sulfur four, something like that. Manganese. Um, yeah, so some of that, sometimes they take a long, long time. And uh, yeah, so having a nice, steady power source that, you know, if you lose your power in your lab, you know, every week, it's pretty tough. Um, so you need, you need to be able to go a month or two without. <laughs> well, that's a huge problem, right? I mean, you know, thunderstorm or, and, uh, you know, having, having reliable power in the lab is a big deal for, for crystal growth. I mean, this is one of the things that nobody thinks about, right, at the upper levels. You know, just making sure the electricity is there every day, you know, without interruption. That makes a big difference. Uh, yeah, losing the power is, in, is terrible. You lose a lot. You can lose a month of work. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know much about, about that. I, I do know that sometimes we'll start by having it go the wrong way and then we'll reverse it and that sometimes will lead to better crystals. Uh, but honestly, if, so, I mean, generally speaking, we're usually happy to get a small number of very good crystals and, and you know, if we can figure out, I mean, we're not, we're not in an in, in industry they want to optimize you know, they're growing the same thing over and over again for years and years and years. Whereas we're trying to grow lots of different materials, get a, you know, get a small number, a relatively small number of good crystals. Uh, so, honestly, so that's something we might try. I don't know, is there a particular material you know that grows that way? Okay. Okay. Okay, well, it may be growing by sublimation rather than actual CVT, right? And it, that, something like that. I'm, I'm not sure. Um. At the beginning of your presentation, in one slide, you explained how could we protect single layer from decomposition. Yes. Sure. Sure. This one? Okay, so what they've learned to do, let me see if I can get the stick of learning here. All right, so here's your substrate, right? This is a silicon substrate with an SiO2 layer on it. So in, in your glove box, right, in the, in the central stacking facility, this was all done at Columbia inside that machine, that, that big glove box with the microscopes and everything. So you can create your single layer of niobium diselenide, which is a superconductor. And then they have this, whatever this is, PDMS. This is some kind of polymer that, that's kind of sticky, right? But it's, it's less sticky. It's the right level of stickiness, OK? And so it looks like, so they've got this boron nitride 
and it looks like their gates are already on there, right? So they got their boron, they've got a piece of boron nitride, which they picked up with this polymer. And they've got these gates that they had evaporated on the boron nitride. And then they pressed it down on top of the niobium diselenide. Okay? And so they end up with something that looks like this, right? You've got your silicon, your SiO2 layer, a piece of niobium diselenide. This is your gate. This is gold or something. Uh, boron nitride on top. So boron nitride is just this wide band gap. It's an insulator, basically. Uh, it's, and, they've, and they've learned. So one of the things that they learned is that if you put boron nitride on top, it protects the, it protects the material underneath without really changing the electronic properties very much. Okay, and so that's, and then they were able to measure, uh, you know, really superconductivity in that one, one single layer. Pretty amazing. Uh, and some other groups have done similar work too. They're not the only group that has done this. Uh, there's a group at Penn State uh, that has done some nice work as well. Does that, does that help? Um, Okay, yeah, so, okay, there's a whole theory for all of this stuff, okay? There's a whole, there's books on it, and you can do calculations with these chemical databases, and you can try to figure it out. Um, so, yeah, so th there are, you can dig into it, uh, or you can just try a few, you know. Um, again, it depends, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there, uh, not, not all the information in those databases is accurate. Uh, it's pretty good to get a good, I mean, you can fool around with the databases. If you, there's a, there's a book, um, I can give you the name of the book after, after, uh, and it gives you all the mathematics, and you can look up all these, you know, you know, delta G's and everything, and you, and you can, you, you can use that approach. Uh, in general, in general, I guess you want to try the, the, iodine is the easiest one. <laughs> Uh, iodine is the easiest one, right? You can, it comes as little flakes, you put them in the tube. You know, the other ones are harder to work with. Um, uh, some of them, like tellurium tetrachloride, you're putting in uh, other elements. You may not want to do that. You know, if there's tellurium in the tube, it may contaminate your samples. Um, you know, nobody wants to work with flowing chlorine or HCl or any nasty things like that. So, uh, so generally, we use a lot of iodine. You know, we've used the tellurium tetrachloride a few times. Um, so I guess, yeah, I mean, we've used bromine a few times. But, you know, we start with the easier ones, to be honest. <laughs> That's generally what, what we do. Are there certain agents that um, tend to be uh, you exothermic or is that just uh, depends on the material you're trying to run? I think it's, it depends on each material. I know the one that uh, James Analytes talked about was an exothermic. Was, most of ours are all endothermic. Yeah, but the one he talked about last year, was it the cadmium 2 arsenic 3, something like that? Yeah. Or it, it's either 2 3 or 3 2. That one was exothermic. Um, yeah. 3 2. Was it 3 2? Okay. <laughs> yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. It's that. Uh, it's that. Yeah. It's probably a little trickier to get to get get it to grow well. I would imagine. Generally, the crystals you get using this technique are a couple of millimeters. You're not going to get huge crystals with vapor transport in general. Uh, you get. I, 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 yeah, I think you can, yeah. Um, I think you can if you're really good. This was the first question is sort of seeding because if you then reverse it halfway through the reaction, the small crystals are lost at the expense of the bigger ones. And so when you come back to it, the bigger ones are sort of like your seeds. Right, right. That's a good point. That's a good point. Or that's just working as a way to check for it. Exothermic or endothermic. Well, maybe. Maybe, yeah. 
It also, but it also you reverse the tube. But that's, the right, it cleans the tube and, and you know, that, yeah, so that's, that's a good point. That's exactly what happens is you start it, you get a lot of little nucleation sites, you reverse it, you know, you can just save some of the bigger ones and then when you go back, those bigger ones will grow at the expense of the little, you know, small ones. It depends on the samples, but uh, typically it's not very much, um, tenth of a percent at most. I mean, it's it's you get some. I mean, there's some there, but it's usually it's usually not terrible. Um, I mean, it's hard to get rid of it in, in, entirely. Um, That's a good question, and it depends on the material, but in general, that's something to check. So uh, one material that I didn't show you uh, is it's called chromium-1,3 niobium sulfur-2, where we're intercalating. It grows with chromium in the van der Waals gap. And in that particular case, different crystals can have different chromium concentrations. Uh, I think it's just to go slow and careful. I, I mean, again, there's a lot we don't, there's a lot of parameters. It's hard to control all the parameters. Um, but yeah, that's a very good question and something that needs to be checked, right? Whether the crystals are all uh, the same in the same batch. Uh, you can never take that for granted. And, and generally speaking, for every particular material, there's one key uh, measurement that you need to make to characterize the quality. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a susceptibility measurement, sometimes it's a resistivity measurement. But uh, you know, in the chromium one third niobium sulfur two, you needed to measure the TC of it. Right? it it's a it's a ferromagnet basically. So you measure the Curie temperature, and it would tell you if it's a good sample or not. So, but but until you know that, there's some materials where we don't know. You know, there's a, the lithium purple bronze. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. But some samples are superconducting or some are insulating. And we still, we don't know whether the superconducting samples or the insulating samples are better. <laughs> so, which is one reason I stopped working on it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, no, you, they, they grow both, right? You grow, they come out of the tubes, some superconduct and some are insulating. And, uh, <laughs> and there's a lot of disorder in those samples. And, uh, but they're potentially extremely interesting because they're quasi 1D and uh, you know there's the, you could have some sort of lutch or liquid behavior and, uh, but but nobody really knows what the best samples would look like uh, <laughs> question It's, well, okay. So g generally it's, it's fairly repeatable, but you know, it's, what was that saying that Reagan used to say, trust but verify? Uh, remember that one? There's a Russian saying. <laughs> they were talking with arms control, trust but verify. Uh, so yeah, we take the same approach to the crystal growth, right? You always have to check your crystals we won't send a crystal out without checking it, basically. You don't just assume that it's good. Um, you have to do some, do some characterizations before you do any further work on it. So you always, always assume that something bad happened. And, but one nice thing is that the color is often a good, you know, if your crystals are supposed to be green and they turn out to be yellow, you know, there's some, something happened. Uh, so. Uh, color is pretty sensitive, actually. Two, two questions. One is, uh, I assume some people in the past or even now do vapor transport at elevated temperatures. Is that something that you know anything about? Or no. Any reason? I, uh, Does it speed it up, for instance, when you crank the temperature up? Uh, to some extent, maybe. 
Um, no, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know anything about going above uh, quartz. Um, it should work. I don't know why it wouldn't for some materials. Um, I don't even know who's done that, actually. Yeah, I, I assume I somebody's done it sometime, but, uh, you know, we're, uh, it would require a big investment in, in time and, and, and equipment, I think, to, to do that well. So uh, that speaks to my other question, which is just these guys. Would you recommend vapor transport as sort of a cheap uh, uh, method of growing crystals fairly readily for people starting up in the lab? And so on? Yes. No, I, I, I highly recommend. If you're having trouble growing something, try a few transport growths. Um, you you would be surprised what things will grow that way. You know, even things like manganese silicide will grow with vapor transport. Iron germanide. These are skirmion hosting materials. Um, you know, there's intermetallics that grow that way. I mean, I showed you a niobium phosphide in one of my slides. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're you can make they're fairly small. Sand. They probably won't be useful for neutrons, but for transport measurements, they're very good. Um, you know, neutrons, well, if you have a very patient student or postdoc who can align 200 of them, you know. <laughs> uh, that's all, yeah, well, maybe 500, I don't know. What's your record, Jeff? I don't know. Okay. No, okay, I, I mean, I think, I know, I know uh, Steve had a student, Steve Nagler at Oak Ridge had a student that aligned 200 of them. This was for like the, one of these chain compounds like the Vopo or something years ago. But yeah, no, if your thesis depends on it, you'll do it. I mean, <laughs> that's sort of, it does, it's not really bad. Once you get down, once you do a few of them, you can sort of recognize the way they look. <laughs> oh yeah, if you have to do it in a glove box. Is this, uh, you're nodding, is this, have you done this? Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah. No. I mean, if it's worth it, if you if you uh, if there's a payoff at the end, I mean, you wouldn't do it for just some. Yeah. If the <laughs> so, it's got to be an interesting material to justify. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. No. Diffraction is is uh, requires a lot less mass. Um, it's those inelastic experiments that are tough. Well, in this, it, so the ruthenium trichloride grows best with no additional chlorine added. So you just put in the ruthenium trichloride uh, polycrystalline material, put it in a gradient, and it grows better that way. It actually is worse when you add extra chlorine. So that was a big one, yeah. Those sublimation is nice uh, when it works. <laughs> Uh, it was about half a gram. That was it. <laughs> so uh, I can sure convert that to kilograms, I guess. <laughs> it was a big crystal. That one grew in a week. No, those grow easily. Once you the, the trick to the ruthenium trichloride is to start with very, very pure polycrystalline material. That's how you get big single crystals. Um, it took us a year to learn how to purify it. Um, to, to the point where, where it would grow big crystals like that. But yeah, that's, uh, so, and, and we needed to flow chlorine and everything. It was, it was very painful. Uh, because if you just put the stuff in that it comes from alpha ASAR, you just get small, junky crystals. Uh, but if you purify and you purify and you purify, eventually when it's really very pure, it'll grow those big crystals. So that's another, probably that's true for a lot of things, right? If you the purer the starting material, the bigger the crystal you'll grow. Well, so there's multiple, multiple approaches to that. Uh, typically, we'll use nitric acid. Uh, oftentimes, you know, when it, whenever you put the tube in the torch, right, you condense all this water vapor, right? And so oftentimes, you want to, you know, try to get, get, get rid of the water before you use the tube um, as much as you can. Um, so yeah, so I mean, maybe sulfuric acid would work, too. I, I mean. 
Oh, I guess, you know, use deionized water, um, several rinses. Um, I mean, we try to be reasonably, we're not at your level of impurities. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're down to, you know, uh, if, if we're, uh, yeah, we're nowhere near your level of purity. Uh, so we, we generally don't worry, you know, we get, just get the crap out as much as we can. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're really on another, many orders of magnitude more pure than what anything we grow. Uh, but, uh, Ah, the scotch tape test is your easiest way. If you have the material in front of you, you just put a piece of scotch tape on it, and uh, that's that's. If if you don't know, if you haven't grown it yet, uh, DFT calculations can do a pretty good job of calculating uh, the cleavage energy and the Young's modulus for a single layer. And if you look into the literature a little bit, they show you how to do that actually. So yes. If you if you if you want to if if you don't have the material handy and you're thinking about it and you don't know if it'll cleave, DFT is pretty good uh, about predicting that. Okay. Yeah. One more. Um, do do uh, does prior research on battery materials in any way uh, inform the search for new interpolation compounds? Sure. I mean, battery materials. Uh, you you want to intercalate lithium, sodium, or whatever you want to use. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, maybe maybe some material you discover will be useful for batteries. Uh, that, I mean, there's a lot of money in batteries if you can find a good material. Um, and it's you know, it's important for our energy economy as well, right? You know, fo all, the whole vo photovoltaics won't work without some kind of storage. So you know, having good good cheap storage is is probably the biggest problem we face, really. So you're saying you didn't even try chloride? It's like, no, world, I don't think so. It, unless we can make that topological computer out of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, with that, All right. so.